Hello. Here. Sorry, we're in a very bad reception area. Oh, that's okay. Just to confirm, sorry, he's bucked off the wall. Yes. Okay. Are you with him now? Yes. Is he awake? Is he awake? No. Just out chasing the elusive fish around. Something I've actually done a few of it since my accident. Um, really got into my fishing and just being out enjoying, enjoying God's creation and just being thankful for for where He's brought me from. Really. Oh, she's a bit chilly this morning. Far out. Oh, he stoned the crows and kicked the neighbour's cat. Just sorting the old cooker out. Pour some hot water to make a brew. That's going to be the go. How yeah, are we looking there? How's that going to spin your prop? Oh. Grew up in Christchurch. Well, family's originally from down south in New Zealand. Mum and dad, they've always had a very strong faith. Basically put that through us kids when we were in high school and then your yeah, mum always prayed for us kids, even with our safety, with whatever we've been doing in life. Hayden has always been a very vivacious, fun person. He's been totally fearless and would talk to anybody, go anywhere, do anything. Just always had a lot of vibrancy of life. I had to go to church as kids, and then once I was hit sort of puberty in high school and sort of, I thought, gee, this Christianity business isn't for me. Uh, I was never a bad person, but um, yeah, definitely, uh, yeah, there's no way you would have got me in a church. I was more sort of living for the weekends, just probably like 80 to 90% of young fellas. Finish the work and week, look forward to a Friday night or a Saturday night at the pub, a few beers, having a good time with the guys, heading away hunting for the weekends, doing whatever, just chasing fun, I suppose. You know, I've always been a bit of an adrenaline sort of chasing sort of a bloke. I sort of heard about this bull riding, and I guess it really excited me, the fact that you know, you come out of the chutes and that and that ball might give you his best buck, sort of second a second or third buck into it. He might give throw you a curve ball and you'd respond with your best spur to the ribs. That really excited me. And I thought, heck yeah, I want to give this thing a bit of a nudge. It sounds pretty exciting. It's a bit of a mixed emotion thing being here back in, in the arena really. I mean, I can't like I mean I can't remember anything that night of the accident. Um, let alone like riding in New Zealand. I remember riding when I was in Australia um, and bucking a few balls out over there, but um, yeah, it's sort of, like I do miss it. I miss it a lot. Went over to Australia, I was contract mustering cattle for a couple of years, and in amongst that, we'd go to radios for fun and we were sort of encouraged to get on some sort of rough stock. Um, and yes, yeah, so I got into bull riding over there, just got on a couple of balls over there and just loved the adrenaline rush. When I got back here, I thought I'd try and give it a serious crack. Went to a practice night after a day of work. I rode my first ball really well, and it was actually the last ride of the night, and they sort of said, oh, you know, last ball, cut up the chutes if anyone wants to jump on it. Um, and me being keen as mustard, I thought, yeah, heck yeah, it's got me all over it. And yeah, famous last words, ball came out of the chutes, got winded, lost control of my body. Uh, and then as he kicked up, I was going forward, uh, and then as he, he was coming back up again for another rear, we collided skulls and I was, I was knocked out before I hit the ground. Everybody piled from out of the arena into the arena, formed a human circle around me because I wasn't moving, and called the ambulance and they, anyway, they ended up getting a chopper in to pick me up. They radioed through to call the, call the immediate family and call the coroner because I didn't think I was going to make it. Is he breathing? Yes. OK, thank you. Is there any serious bleeding? Yes. Okay, I'm organising help for you now. Stay on the line and I'll tell you exactly what to do next. Got a call about 10 past 10 to say that he would have been airlifted into hospital. We didn't know anything about what had been happening. I would just knew when we got there to the trauma room that they'd taken him straight for x-ray. When I got to hospital, 
First of all, they gave me a CAT scan, realised I had uh, a brain bleed and fragments of my skull and lodged in my brain. And friends of ours actually know someone that was in the scanning room that night of the accident. As soon as they read my scan, they said there is, there's no way, it's not humanly possible for this boy to walk out of here alive. Pete and I looked at each other in the waiting room and we looked at each other and we said, we're ready to handle this. We're, we knew our faith was strong. We knew we were in a position in our life that we could separate ourselves from our work and we could do what needed to be done. They sent out the prayer requests to people all around the globe and people were praying for this kid that didn't want to know a God. Wasn't really in that market, just wanted to ride balls and have fun. Oh, slap there, slap there. Oh, oh. Very quickly overnight our house filled up. We had a lot of Hayden's friends came and stayed. A couple of girls took over the cooking and I just said, look, I cannot host anybody. You're most welcome to stay, but I'm at the hospital. And I remember speaking to the head doctor in ICU on the Friday morning, three days before Hayden came out of his coma. And they just said, look, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I have to, we have to um, give them a tracheotomy. We're looking at long-term ICU. I'm so sorry, but we can't do any more. And I said, I know, but I'm not listening to that. I said, I'm praying for you, and I know by standing by in faith. Monday morning, he came out of his coma, and he was sitting up in a chair that afternoon, and, um, and he was walking. This way, this way. That's it. <laughs> One of the nurses was quite surprised. She said, usually people take two or three steps when they're first learning to walk again. Very rare you'll see someone walk all the way down to the end of the corridor. Good one, Hayden. Looking up, love. From my accident, I was in a coma for about 12 days. It was, brain surgery was for about five hours, five and a half hours. And then I was only in hospital ward 28 for two days. And they were short on beds. I went to Laura Ferguson, uh, in which case I was there for like nine months before I was allowed to go home. The first two months, there wasn't a day that went by that I did not want to be here. Like, I would, would not have trusted myself to go hunting by myself. I was in a very dark place. The rug of life had just been ripped out from underneath me. I'd gone from potentially staring down the barrel of a professional bull riding career, and now I'm living back at home with my parents. I can't even cook a meal by myself. I'm thinking life couldn't get any worse. And I remember one night, it was dark, nobody was around, and I cried out to Jesus. I thought, I don't know anybody here, I don't know where I am, what's going on. Um, please help me, God, if you're real, please help me. Uh, and I remember looking back up, and I saw this bloke at the end of my bed holding my feet. He had very dark facial features and hair to about his shoulders, and he was wearing a fluorescent white cloak. Uh, and all he said was, I've got you, Hayden, you're not going anywhere. And from there, my life has changed dramatically. We couldn't see our way forward at that stage. No. We just need to take it one day at a time. Mm. Not overthinking it and um, just relying on God to show us the next step. Mm. And he's done that all the way through. It's very reassuring to know that I've got a mum that's always prayed for me. Whether she knows I've been in times of trouble or not, but she's just always diligently prayed. She's just kept, she's just been an absolutely warrior for us kids in the spirit. And especially for me, since my accident, she's just been incredibly diligent and there's no way I'd be where I am in my recovery without her prayer life. When looking at photos and videos and that of me in hospital, it's a reminder of where I've come from and how thankful I am to have the Lord in my life and, and where he's brought me from and where I could be without his help. So for me now, if I ever see bulls in a paddock or livestock, I've got certainly a lot, lot more respect for them. Especially the ones that have been trained for rodeo, they're bovine athletes, they really are. And basically when they get when that shoot gate opens, they've just got a job to do, they don't want to hurt anybody. A lot of respect for them now for what they can do um, and how powerful they are. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's right, is that? Oh, she's done another knot on us. Why is it doing that? It's actually done quite a good one. The one knot you don't want to do on the riverbank, especially when your hands are cold. Could be worse, though, unless it's on a cold morning. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
a lot of fishing guys I used to ride with, they've all said, oh, you know, heck, you're so lucky, you know. And I guess one way of looking at it, but like luck, in my opinion, luck would have been if I fell off the ball that night and both of his feet were planted either side of my head, that would have been luck. Um, but medically speaking, I should have died that night because I got half my skull cave done and I didn't, and only reason why is because there were lots of people praying and the Lord reached out and saved my life. Otherwise, there's no way I'd still be here.